Bibles with us to the book of Exodus chapter 3. Exodus chapter 3. And we want to read verses 11 through 15 this evening to begin. Exodus chapter 3, beginning with verse 11, reading down through verse 15. And Moses said unto God, Who am I that I should go unto Pharaoh, and that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt? And he said, Certainly I will be with thee, and this shall be a token unto thee, that I have sent thee. When thou hast brought forth the people out of Egypt, ye shall serve God upon this mountain. And Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel, and shall say unto them, The God of your fathers hath sent me unto you, and they shall say to me, What is his name? What shall I say unto them? And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am has sent me unto you. And God said, Moreover unto Moses, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, has sent me unto you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial unto all generations. And we want to take our topic and title of our message from that uh, last verse, where he said, This is my name forever, and this is my memorial unto all generations. This is my memorial. Uh, one of the things in studying Scripture that I was taught a long time ago, when you want to understand something, uh, find the first time it's mentioned in the Bible. The law of first mention. And that would generally set the, the understanding and application for that word or that uh, topic, that text, whatever, through the rest of the Scripture for that word. Uh, and so this is the first mention of a memorial in the Scriptures is Exodus 3.15. He's talking about His name. And He said, This will be a memorial, uh, my memorial, unto all generations. This is how He will be known. Uh, there was some discussion about the, this afternoon about the appropriateness or propriety of remembering the dead uh, because this is something that the pagans do and sometimes there are things that's kind of closely loosely associated uh, with uh, practices of uh, pagan and because the pagans worship the dead and they honor their worship their ancestors and I was thinking about this this afternoon and one thing we need to remember that for everything that God has taught us and commanded us and revealed to us, Satan always comes up with a counterfeit, an anti uh, of it, um, some evil equivalent to it. Uh, so we need to use some discernment. And, and God did it first but Satan comes along and comes up with a counterfeit of it. But after generations has gone by, you know, I've heard people talk about, well, because the Egyptians did, that some of these ideas originated with the Egypt, not with Moses. You know, and different things like that. That Moses got these ideas from Egypt. No, he, he didn't get it from Egypt. He got it from God, and God predated Egypt. Uh, but that's the way some people look at this. And so we just need to be careful. Um, Satan, through man's corrupt and fallen nature, can find a way to pervert almost anything to evil use. Um, and I was thinking about that, that, you know, Proverbs 21.4 says, even the plowing of the wicked is sin. 
because the wicked do it, do we not plow then? No, the, dis the difference is they do it in unbelief. We plow in faith, trusting and praying to God that He will give us the increase. That's the difference. And so we need to be able to discern spiritual differences when we examine not just this, but anything. And we must let the Scriptures be our guide and see what saith the Lord in this matter as in all things. The Scripture should shape and guide our attitude toward a practice and direct how we as believers should observe a practice if we observe it at all. Now the second mention of a memorial is in Exodus chapter 12, verse 14. I want to turn over there. And this is in reference to the Passover. And the blood of the Passover. Uh, and how the, the death angel was to pass through Egypt that night. And God instituted the feast of the Passover. And the blood of the Passover lamb was to be taken. And applied to the doorposts over the houses wherein they ate uh, the Passover lamb. And verse 13. And the blood shall be to you a token upon the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. And so he says, it's a token that when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And verse 14, and this day shall be unto you for a memorial. And you shall keep it a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. You shall keep it a feast by an ordinance forever. And so here we see a memorial that was established by God, which was to be observed annually upon a particular day throughout their generations. And that's one of the things of a memorial. And there's different types of memorials. But the idea is to cause us to remember. And that's the, the whole purpose of a memorial. Is to cause us to remember. Now there's some things in life that we need to remember. And anything that we do that helps us to remember uh, is good. Um... We see in the Scriptures certain events were to be remembered. As in our text, the exodus from Egypt, the death of the firstborn, the Passover, the death angel passed over because of the blood. This was to be remembered. It was, there was a memorial. Another one we see the, in the book of Joshua chapter 4, Joshua followed Moses and was to lead the people into the conquest of the land. And he was to lead the people when they crossed over the Jordan River. And in Joshua chapter 4, verse 6 and 7, uh, one of the things that he, he told them to do, said, now when you cross over Jordan, he said, the, the priests are going to go before you, and they're going to, as they go, so the waters are going to part, and they're going to stand still in the midst of the Jordan River. So this is what I want you to do. You take a man, one man from each of the twelve tribes, and you pick up a stone, and when you cross over, you carry it on you to place it in the middle of the Jordan River. And they were to take stones from the Jordan River. And when they crossed over, they was to set up a pile on the bank on the other side of the Jordan River. Where they had crossed. And verse 6 said that 
this may be a sign among you that when your children ask their fathers in time to come, saying, What mean ye by these stones? Then ye shall answer them that the waters of Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord. When it passed over Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off, and these stones shall be for a memorial unto the children of Israel forever. In other words, they set up a monument. And the word memory, monument, and memorial all come from the same root. They have the same connecting idea to them. What is a monument? That is a, a, something to cause us to remember. Something happened here. You know, you go to some of these battlefields and you'll see a monument. Then you can go drive down the, up Saginaw here and uh, some of these buildings, they'll have a plaque. And, and it tells you there's something important or this building was important or this was a historical site. Matter of fact, as you drive along the Bryan Station Road, right where it crosses the Elkhorn Creek, there's a plaque on the side of the road. It's one of those little Kentucky historical markers. Something important happened here. There was a spring still there. There's a, and there's a monument around that spring. This is where the fort stood. This is where they withstood the siege in, in 1782 at Fort Bryan Station, which was manned almost to a man by Baptists that had come over from Virginia. Lewis Craig and his brothers and their in-laws and families were present in the fort during that siege. And it was in that fort, out elements from that traveling church, that the Bryan Station Church was organized in 1786. And there on the property now that was deeded to them by Joseph Rogers, across the creek, on an opposite hill from where the fort used to stand, there's a little historical monument marker there, and there's a monument there around that spring so that we remember something happened here. And that's what these stones were. It was a monument. It was a memorial to how God, after He brought them up out of Egypt, after they had crossed the Red Sea, after they had wandered in the wilderness for 40 years, according to His promise, He led the children of Israel across that Jordan River into what was the land promised to them. And they were going to begin the conquest of it. And in that statement, if you think about it, there was the promise that they would conquer the land. God had promised it to them. That's why they were there. He led them there. They crossed over the Jordan. Because future generations, obviously God was informing them that they would succeed because future generations of their children would be there in the land. Those who didn't cross the river, those whose fathers hadn't really crossed the river. But the time would come when they would come by that way and they'd see this monument, this pile of stones. They said, what's that pile of stones there for? It was a memorial so that they would remember what God had done. We see other things in, in, in Numbers 31. Okay, go back. They had fought the Amalekites, I believe it was. Or no, Midianites. And they had been victorious. And they had taken a spoil. And they divided up the spoil amongst the people. 
But we see here in verse 48, And the officers which were over thousands of the host, the captains of thousands and captains of hundreds, came near unto Moses. And they said unto Moses, Thy servants have taken the sum of the men of our war which were under our charge, and there lacked not one man of us. We have therefore, they were, evidently they fought this battle, they didn't lose a single man. That's unusual. They go through this conflict, they defeat a, a, a people, and when it was over, they, they took a roll call, they counted their men, and, and they hadn't lost any. And so, verse 50, We have therefore brought an oblation for the Lord that every man hath gotten of jewels of gold, chains and bracelets, rings, earrings and tablets, to make an atonement for our souls before the Lord. And Moses and Eliezer the priest took the gold of them, even all the wrought jewels and all the gold of the offering that they uh, offered up to the Lord of the captains of the thousands and the captains of the hundreds was 16,750 shekels. For the men of war had taken spoil every man for himself. And Moses and Eliezer the priest took the gold of the captains of thousands and of the hundreds and brought it into the tabernacle of the congregation for a memorial for the children of Israel before the Lord. And so here is another memorial. Uh, something done, offered up in remembrance uh, so that they would remember how God had blessed them and, and they had won a victory and they had won it without the loss of any life. Uh, so we see victory in battle. In the book of Esther, and, and there's others besides these. I'm just kind of trying to hit the highlights here. Uh, but in Esther, Esther chapter 9. Now if you're familiar with the story of Esther, this was during the captivity. And Esther had been placed in a position that she was the wife of the king Ahasuerus of no, not Syria, but uh, the Assyrians. No, the, the Persians. There we go. I'll get it right now. I had to think back through my history, you know, which captivity and so on. Uh, this was after Nebuchadnezzar, the Medes, and the Persians had come in and conquered Nebuchadnezzar. This was during the captivity. They was in captivity to Persia. And she was married to the king and become the, the wife of the king. And he loved her. But there was an enemy. There was one who hated the Jews and was jealous. And he sought to have them destroyed. And, you know, we've seen this device used many times to where you, you get somebody to sign, you slip it in with some other things and get them to sign it without them knowing what they're signing. Uh, Hiram did something along that order. He deceived the king and said, there, there's some people, there's some rebellious people and everything here. And, uh, and basically he got an order signed to allow the, the uh, Persians to rise up and to kill the Jews throughout all the territories. And Esther, you know, for such a time as this, or thou come to the kingdom. Mordecai, her uncle, uh, said you need to make the king aware of this and don't think that you're going to be safe there in the palace you know and, and, and so on and so she goes to the king and reveals the plot to the king he overturns it he can't change that law so he makes another one that kind of counteracts it and said uh, on the day before that was said any of the Jews then uh, if the people rose up against them or plotted against them, they could rise up and kill them. And so, through this, a great deliverance was achieved for the Jewish people. And so, we see here a time of um, national deliverance. And in verse 
28. There's a couple of verses preceding this. Uh, verse 21, to establish this among them, they should keep the 14th day of the month Adar and the 15th day of the same month yearly. Uh, it says in verse 22 that uh, this turned this into a good day, that they should make them days of feasting and joy and ascending portions one to another and gifts to the poor. And so he said this is to be a, 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 a yearly day of celebrating and remembering. And verse 28, well, uh, verse 27, the last part says, and according to their appointed time every year, Verse 28, and that these days should be remembered and kept throughout every generation, every family, every province, and every city. And that these days of Purim should not fail from among the Jews, nor the memorial of them perish from their seed, or the memory of them. So here was a memorial. Uh, it was a remembrance every year for this national deliverance. And so... One of the things that we see here, and this was not one of the religious feast days that was given by God, but the people of Israel themselves established this day because of this great event, a national deliverance in the land of captivity in Persia and through all the provinces of the Persian king that they were spared and they were delivered. And so here was a memorial day, uh, a remembrance of this deliverance that was established by them. And so one of the things this shows us, every generation has its lessons, has its victories and defeats, which future generations need to remember. And we remember them through monuments, through days uh, that are set aside to remember and different things. Otherwise, the sacrifices and laws and the efforts and the accomplishments of these people would be forgotten and would be in vain. Because one of the things is that these accomplishments then benefit future generations. And future generations need to remember those things which their forefathers have done. And, and this is a part of the idea. And the Feast of the Passover, which we already mentioned there in, in Exodus, the second mention of a memorial had to do with the feast of the Passover and establishing of the feast of the Passover. And this feast had another significance. And its true meaning which was fulfilled in Christ our Passover when he was sacrificed for us. It's how Paul refers to it in, in 1 Corinthians the 5th chapter. He refers to Jesus Christ. Uh, you know, and talk about the leaven and how the, the unleavened bread, all the leaven was put out and said, let us keep the feast, you know, with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. He said, as Christ, our Passover, who is without sin, was sacrificed for us. And so there was a significance in the Passover that the Jews did not understand. They looked at it looking back to when God brought them out of Egypt. But in that, in the, the blood of the Passover lamb, and seeing that, there was a, a type there of looking forward to a future event. And we see in Matthew chapter 26 then, Matthew 26 and verse 26. And as they were eating, and what they were eating was the 
Passover, verse 17. Now the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the disciples came to Jesus saying to Him, Where wilt thou that we prepare for thee to eat the Passover? And so here we see all these generations later, the Jews are still keeping the Passover. Because it was established as a memorial throughout all their generations forever. And so here they were preparing the Passover to eat the Passover. And verse 26, and as they were eating, Jesus took bread. You know, the bread at the Passover, the unleavened bread. Uh, and he said, uh, and he blessed it and break it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. And so we see out of this one memorial feast, Jesus, taking these elements, established another memorial. Now the Gospel of Luke, Luke chapter 22 and verse 19. And he took bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them saying, This is my body which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. And I was looking. Luke is the only one of the Gospels that includes that phrase. This do in remembrance of me. And when Paul is instructing the church in Corinth in the observance of the Lord's Supper, he quotes that phrase in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Uh, verse 23 says, For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which He was betrayed, took bread, and when He had given thanks, He brake it, and said, Take, eat, this is My body which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of Me. I thought it was interesting. Luke is the only Gospel writer that includes that. Luke was the one who accompanied Paul on his missionary journeys. Paul learned from Luke. And I thought that was, that was interesting. That uh, when you I was looking at that, and Paul uses that phrase, this do in remembrance of me. And none of the other gospel writers except Luke includes that. And then it dawned on me, well, that would make sense because that was the one who accompanied Paul was the historian uh, recording uh, the accounts of Paul's missionary journeys. Um, and so this do in remembrance of me. This is a memorial uh, supper. The Lord's Supper. A memorial in remembrance of Christ's finished work of redemption to be kept by His churches till He returns. And so, here's another memorial. Now, it's a memorial which looks upon the death. Not just the death, the burial and resurrection, but this, this primary, as we have two church ordinances, and this particular one focuses on the death, the sacrifice that was made that we might have uh, the forgiveness of sin. So, as we point out, a memorial can be a monument to cause us to remember an event or persons. You know, that's kind of what gravestones are. It's a marker. It's a memorial. It's a monument. Here lies someone. This was a person. This person had a life. This person had loved ones. Um, it can include some kind of celebration, feasting, etc. 
It can also be words, lyrics, a song, which causes us to remember. You know, songs sometimes are memorials too, to events, people, so on. National Anthem, Star Spangled Banner, was written because of an event. And we remember that event because we sing that song, the lyrics of that song. And so every time we sing that song, it should remind us of the battle that took place and why that battle took place and our independence, because that was after the Revolutionary War, it was during the War of 1812, the contention with the same people. We were still struggling for our independence, in effect, at that time. Peter saw the need to help believers remember. Second Peter chapter 3. Peter wrote two epistles or two letters. In 2 Peter chapter 3 verse 1 he says, This second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you, in both which, that is, not only in this epistle, but in the first one also, I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance, that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets, and the commandment of us, the apostles, of the Lord and Savior. And, and he goes on. And so he said, I'm writing this to stir up your minds by way of remembrance that you might re be mindful of the words that have been spoken. And so it's important sometimes that uh, we as believers remember some things. He said, stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance might be mindful of the words. And then in Philippians, Paul writes and finally said, if there be anything, let me turn there because I am not going to quote it correctly. Philippians 4.8 Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, talking about your pure, stir up your pure minds, Whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. And so we need to be reminded, we need to have our minds stirred up occasionally that we might be mindful of those things which have been spoken in the past. And that we've heard in the past. That we might remember them. Because Satan is constantly, as we pointed out constantly, trying to give us something new. Divert our attention. Get us off track. And so we need to go back and be mindful of the words that we've already heard and what God has already uh, revealed to us. We need to think on these things. It's always appropriate to remember what the Lord has said to us. And to remember what the Lord has done for us. And to remember what the saints of God have done in His service. However we choose to keep those things, those memories alive. in addition to those things that the Lord has commanded through the ordinances of baptism and the Lord's Supper. Just as the Jews, the Feast of Purim was something they added was in addition to the feasts and all that God had prescribed and given to them before. So, this brings us to the Lord's Supper. It's a memorial to be observed in remembrance of Jesus Christ and His finished work. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Paul touches upon the elements of the Lord's Supper. Um, verse 
17, he says, uh, For we being many are one bread and one body, for we are all partakers of that one bread. He says in verse 16, The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? And so the one loaf that he mentioned here, the one bread, we are to remember his body, which is broken and bruised for us. Isaiah 53 Familiar passage of Scripture. Isaiah 53, verses 4 and 5 says, Surely He has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem Him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon Him. And with his stripes we are healed. So all we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. And so the loaf, the bread that we partake of is in remembrance of his body which was broken and bruised for us. He says, Is not this the communion? partaking the fellowship of the body of Christ. And we see the cup also mentioned here in Corinthians. It said the cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? Remember His blood which was shed to redeem us Isaiah 63, verse 3 says, I have trodden the winepress alone. Now the people, there was none with me. One of the things we see about the Lord Jesus Christ, both in this uh, reference to a future when he comes back and actually the battle of Armageddon. But we see here also a reference to his dying on the cross. The winepress of the fierceness of the anger and wrath of God was poured out upon him. And his blood, he was crushed there. His body was broken and bruised for us. And his blood was shed to make an atonement and to uh, redeem us the price paid to redeem us from our sins and he tread that wine press alone there was none other that could drink of that cup he said if it be possible let this cup pass from me nevertheless not my will but thy will be done there was no one else who could take that cup and drink those bitter dregs, the wrath of God, but the Lord Jesus Christ. And he said, this is the New Testament in my blood. John chapter 6. One of the many conversations and disputes that Jesus had with the Pharisees and religious rulers of his day. But notice what he says here, verse 53, John 6, verse 53, Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and I in him. As the living Father hath sent me, and I live by the Father, 
So he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. Now these words of the Lord Jesus Christ is not implying that we should literally eat his flesh or drink his blood. But he's pointing to the fact, he says this is the communion. This is the fellowship. This is the partaking. So when we eat of this bread and we drink of this cup, we are, this is the communion. We are partaking by faith the benefits of that which was accomplished by his death on the cross. We, we eat the unleavened bread. That's not his flesh. But it is that which represents his flesh, which was, was broken and bruised for us. The, the wine, that's not his blood. But it is symbolic of his blood, which was shed for us. You know, his body, which was broken and bruised for us, and by his stripes we were healed. We had the forgiveness of sin. So tonight, as we come to the Lord's table, Paul chapter 10 refers to it as the Lord's table. There is one table, which I believe signifies our unity, that we come together here at this one table to partake of this memorial supper. type of our unity. We see this table is set in the Lord's local church showing the autonomy and authority of the church in observing and, and uh, guarding uh, this table as well as partaking from it. And this represents our unity as does the one loaf and the one cup. We see here then the one bread that we come, that we break, we give thanks and, and break it. Unleavened bread, type of the body of Jesus Christ, which was broken for us. Unleavened because he was without sin. He established a perfect righteousness which then in turn by faith is imputed to us. You think about this. And we partake as we eat of this bread. We're signifying, we're showing, as Paul says, we do show the Lord. We're showing that by faith we have been partakers of of the, that perfect righteousness which is imputed to us. So, our life is in Christ. And when God looks at us through His Son, He sees a perfect righteousness. No sin. What a blessed position and standing we have. Let us give thanks for this one loaf, this bread. Gracious Heavenly Father, we come this evening. We thank you now for this opportunity that we can remember that our pure minds may be stirred up to remember Jesus dying on the cross for us and how he lived a perfect life without sin Though tested and observed, no fault could be found in him. And he was acceptable as a lamb without spot and without blemish. He was an acceptable sacrifice for us. And not only that, but his perfect righteousness is imputed to us. That before you, that we can come and we stand perfect, without spot, without blemish, before you in love. Father, we just thank you for this wonderful gift. 
eternal life, forgiveness of sin, perfect righteousness, which we have through faith in your Son, Jesus Christ. And we thank you for storing up our minds to remember this and to draw us up close to you. That in partaking of this, we're reminded once more how that by faith we believed and partook of the sacrifice of Christ on the cross. We ask this now in Jesus' name. For his sake we pray. Amen. given thanks for it, he broke it and gave it to them and said, take eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Also, we see the one cup, the wine, type of his blood which was shed for the redemption, forgiveness of our sins, which were imputed to Him. Our sin was imputed to Him. And the wrath of God for our sin fell upon Him. And He took and embraced that. And it said in, in the symbolism, He was trotting out the, the, the fierceness of the wrath of Almighty God in Himself there on the cross. He did that alone. Because none else could take that cup. None else could accomplish what He did. And His blood was shed. The life of the flesh is in the blood. And He gave His life to redeem us. And His blood was shed to redeem us that redemptive price that was paid that we might have the forgiveness of sin. Let us give thanks for the cup. Gracious Heavenly Father, we come again. We thank You for the blessing of the blood that was shed for us. It is hard for us to imagine all that went into and was accomplished by the death of our Savior on the cross. We cannot imagine and comprehend the suffering uh, that He endured there upon the cross. Yet the travail of His soul was sufficient that you were satisfied, your law was satisfied. And Lord, we just give you thanks for it and for this cup which represents to us that as we partake and drink of this wine, this fruit of the vine, which was crushed, that we might be reminded and remember the sufferings of our Lord Jesus Christ on the cross and His blood that was shed, and that we might Rejoice that our sins are under that blood and will never be remembered again. That we have eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. In His name we pray. Amen.
Scripture says that under the law, almost all things were purged with blood. Without the shedding of blood, there could be no remission of sins. Jesus shed His blood and said, This is the new covenant, the New Testament, my blood, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. He gave it to them and said, Drink ye all of it. Now he says that as often as you eat this bread, drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till He come. And so there is a remembrance every time that we observe this of His sacrifice for us. But there's also a remembrance, a reminder of His promise that He's coming back. Now, both these events are important. Both these things are, are key and essential and, and the, the very basis of Christianity. Jesus' death on the cross that we might have the forgiveness of sin. And His return to receive us to Himself, that where He is, there we may be also. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. And so as oft as we drink this, we show His death till He comes. It's a remembrance, a reminder of that which has been accomplished by His death on the cross and the way that has been opened for us and prepared for us, that we have forgiveness of sin, we have eternal life, we have unlimited access to the throne of God. And then one day He's coming back, and we're going to be raised, and we're going to be changed, we're going to have a glorified body, and forever we're going to be in His presence. This do in remembrance of me. We want to stand together at this time. And is as is the custom, because when he instituted the Lord's Supper, he says they sang a hymn and went out. Now, I don't know. We, there's not a whole lot of things in the Scripture about all the exact form and of worship and and sequence and everything, we've developed our own habits and customs over the years. But when we come to the observance of the Lord's Supper, we like to close the service not so much in prayer, but in the singing of a hymn. So we'll have prayer first, and then we will sing the hymn. And with the singing of the hymn, we are dismissed from the service. Gracious Heavenly Father, we come, Lord, we give you thanks again for this day and all of your watch care over us. Father, for bringing us safely through this past week, for the blessings and fellowship we have enjoyed this day. Father, from being able to take time off from our work and labors and all the cares of this world, that we can come together and meet with you that Your Spirit may be present with us to, to teach us and to strengthen us and to uh, give us uh, not only knowledge but the grace and strength uh, that we need. And Father, we just pray now that as we're dismissed from this place and this service, that You'll go with us, that You'll give Your angels charge over each one of us, that You will lead, guide, and direct us, protect us, provide for our needs in all things. And help us to be to the praise of the glory of your grace and bring us back into thy house at the appointed times. Forgive us of our sins and where we fail thee. We ask these things now in Jesus' name and for his sake we pray. And amen. And also, instead of singing our usual closing hymn, we close the Lord's Supper by singing hymn number 487, Amazing Grace. Sing all four verses. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that 
save a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I am found. Was blind, but now. Oh